So I'm going to be reading out loud the book All My Broken Pieces by Cindy Watts. It's Cindy Watts' story of observing the life between her son, Chris Watts, and his girlfriend, then fiance, then wife, then murder victim, Shanann Watts, and their children, Bella and Celeste, and unborn baby Nico. What I've come to learn about All My Broken Pieces is that it is, is essentially contained in the book by Kathleen Houston, Blood and Marriage, that my friend A Curious Rose has read over on her channel, so I suggest you go check it out. Now, Blood and Marriage is even more extensive and talks about more dynamics and scenarios than does All My Broken Pieces. It's really an interesting perspective and interesting stories are indeed told. All My Broken Pieces by Cindy Watts and Jamie Watts, you should know, is referred to as Sarah throughout this book. I don't think, even once, not when I was a little girl even, that I expected or wanted everyone in our country to know my name. Maybe every little girl dreams of being a princess and now an internet star, but they didn't have internet stars when I was a kid, and they don't have any princesses or stars at all where I always lived, except for those in the sky. If anyone had been interested or asked me 10 years ago what I wanted, I would have told them I already had it, a good marriage to a fine man and two wonderful children. By back then, I have to qualify and say that I mean back before my son married a woman that was wrong for him and began to lose himself. And we began to lose him as well. Our pain started then, and over the next eight years, our lives tilted downhill and became sadder, more complicated, and filled with growing amounts of unwanted drama and fear until we finally ended up here, at the bottom, in a damaged, grieving heap, broken into pieces. Two of our granddaughters are dead. The young woman who was our daughter-in-law is dead, and her family is devastated as well. Our boy is in many ways as lost to us as though he were dead. Our family is in rubble, and the whole world seems to know our names and hate us. We just exist and try to breathe through permanently constricted throats, trying to find a way any way at all to go on living for what we have left, who we have left, including each other in our new reality, which is simply moment by moment wreckage. I am not writing this book to ask for sympathy. I am writing it because there are always three sides to every story, hers, his, and the truth. Maybe I cannot know the truth any more than all the millions of strangers worldwide who seem to think that they do. But I know some things. I know our family. I know my son. Or maybe I don't. And I wish to gain understanding of him and his actions through this process. And to a degree... I know the story of the marriage that led us all here. I want to tell people about these things. I know at least. As to what I hope will come of it, well, I don't hope for much anymore. But no matter what you think of me, of us, remember this. Chris is still my child. And if you have ever had and love children, then you wish to hold them and comfort them when they are damaged. You wish to make it right. I can't make this right, and I may never hold my son again, never be able to comfort him. I can tell my story, though, or my truth, if you will, and hope for understanding. This is the story of us, 
before, during, and after the slide. It's the story of our son meeting and marrying Shanann and what occurred during their marriage. It's the story of our granddaughters as we knew them and of our son's life during those years and their aftermath. This is about us, a group of ordinary people as we actually are and not as those who think they know us or might wish to be. Because if what they say of us were true, then something like this could never happen to you or someone you love, and that reassurance I can't give anyone anymore. As painful as the words of strangers are, those who know nothing of us but feel they do, I hold no grudges. I might have thought the same as they do before when it wasn't us before, meaning before my family became one of those that people read about and shake their heads over and then immediately run to their laptops to say such things as, I guess I would have drowned him at birth. Or if that wasn't personal enough, They speculate about whether it was me or my husband, Ronnie, who is the psychopath and whose horrible parenting or genes, take your pick or choose both, has twisted up our boy so bad that he was always destined to grow up to become a, quote, family annihilator, end quote. The worst, of course, the very worst, and I think what truly drove this book is the people who have written that my beautiful young grandson is going to grow up to be another Chris. God help you to find more kindness for an innocent boy and maybe to find in these pages the answer that there aren't any real answers. I mean, as to how this tragedy happened or what could have stopped it, because you can't see that if we could have, we would have, Please, if nothing else, believe that. I'd like to thank you, the reader, for listening to my story and for giving me your time as I travel this road again. Chris was a really good kid. It's not just me who says so. Everyone who ever met and knew him said so too. He was very gentle and quiet and never caused us a single problem. He was an honor student who loved sports and made a nice life for himself in Mooresville, North Carolina after high school and then NASCAR Tech. Then he met Shanann. Chapter 1. Everybody talks about their dreams for their children, but I can safely say that there is only one that we parents have. We just want them to be happy. Of course, there is no bigger dream, and in many cases, nothing harder to achieve. And the difficult thing is that we really can't do one thing about helping them to be happy. That's mostly down to luck, I think. Our boy's luck ran out pretty early on. Both my kids were born kind. It's just that Sarah never met a stranger in her life, and Chris, well, he liked people just fine, but he came out reserved and quiet, just like his dad, and he stayed that way. He had a few close friends, and I guess if I wondered how it would go for him later, and I did, because I'm a mother, I hoped that somewhere out there ahead of him was a sweet girl who would Think like I had about Ronnie and value him for what he was. She would, I hoped, simply enjoy being with my sweet, good, hardworking boy and build a life with him. And what spare time Chris had, he continued his lifelong enjoyment of exercise and being outside and coming down to visit us and his sister and our new family member, Sarah's little boy, Wyatt. And of course, he took every opportunity to go see NASCAR with his dad. I was glad of that too. I love Ronnie, but those races are too loud for me and I don't think I was missed. Those two loved hanging out together. 
Our family stayed close, and we saw a lot of Chris despite the three-hour drive from Monroeville to Spring Lake. He and Wyeth had become best friends, too, and Uncle Chris was always a favorite visitor for him and Sarah and Steve when they were expecting their second baby, which we were all overjoyed about. I think we were all happy in that simple way of being, so without noticing it, I guess by that, I mean, things, things were on track. Sarah, who is by far the most outgoing member of our family, decided to host a barbecue. Nothing big, just a casual little thing with a few friends and family. We weren't nervous exactly, but we were a little surprised because Chris had sheepishly announced to us that his new girlfriend was 40, and since he was only 24, well, I can't say what I thought. I was definitely curious, though. When Chris arrived, it was with a young, pretty, dark-haired woman. Her name was Shanann King, and she didn't look anywhere near 40. Ronnie didn't seem to be bothered by it, but Sarah and I did a little whispering in the kitchen, wondering why Chris had told us that she was so much older than she obviously was. Finally, we asked him. He grinned and brought Shanann over, and they laughed and said it had been her idea, and wasn't it hilarious? We laughed too, but to this day, I never have figured out why she wanted us to think that she was so much older. Still, Chris seemed to like her a lot, and she was very friendly and outgoing, and who gets every joke anyway? So we weren't worried. I suppose we were happy he'd found someone he liked enough to want to introduce us to, and she seemed to have a lot going for her. An extraordinary amount of things, actually. She was, as it turned out, only a year older than Chris. And she was pretty and very outgoing, which probably was an excellent thing. Since he was shy, she could bring him out of his shell is, I guess, what I thought. Remember, please, I'm trying very hard here to look back as honestly as I can. All of us have to keep doing that, to remember how it was not how it became if we are going to attempt this story. She was pretty and funny, and in the beginning, it seemed like she wanted all of us to be friends and get to know each other and, well, all those normal things. Also, we are a family that believes in hard work and trying to do the best you can. And when we met her, she was driving a Cadillac Escalade from the company she said she worked for, Dirty South. And then there was her house. Now, a lot of money and big houses don't mean anything to me personally. I don't want to live anywhere but in our little 1,100 square foot house until the day I die. But I know those things are important to a lot of people, and that's fine. Hard work, whether it's for your own personal satisfaction as well as putting a roof over your head, no matter how small or large, seems to me to make people feel good about themselves. And the roof Shanann had put over her head with her hard work was a big one. In fact, it looked like a mansion. It was, as Sarah commented to me, the biggest and grandest house she'd ever seen, then or now. It had three formal living rooms, for heaven's sakes, and each one of them, well, every room had the most beautiful furniture I'd ever seen in all of them. It sat right beside a lake, and there was a boathouse, too. For the people who lived in that subdivision, I'm guessing that a boat wasn't out of the question. Her bedroom was massive and beautiful. She had these little clocks and things she said she ordered from Switzerland. It was perfect, like a castle, and she said she had bought and paid for it from her job at Dirty South by the age of 25. She told me, in fact, that when she had approached the builders and told them what she wanted, they didn't take her a bit seriously until she opened up a suitcase she had bought and pulled out $20,000 in cash. You had to be impressed with that no matter what. 
I saw years later that her brother Frankie said that she was always a hard worker and was making half a million a year. And to maintain that house, I think you would have to be pulling that in. Like I said, she was also driving a company car from Dirty South, though she had told Sarah that she was either taking a break from there or had quit. Sarah isn't positive which. And that she was working as a nanny at the time instead. She also mentioned that she had worked at The Gap previously, so I don't have any idea how she was managing it all. She didn't come from any more wealth than Chris had, just a nice, ordinary people. And if she had won the lottery, which I could have believed, she didn't mention it, and she would have. Because right from the start, Shanann pretty much said everything she thought and told us a lot about her life. We heard right away about her lupus and the fibromyalgia and her migraines, the endometriosis and the celiac disease she brought up, brought up later. She told us she divorced a man who she had put through school and that he had been physically unattractive and that despite that, he had also cheated on her. She also told us she had recently been in a single car accident and had hurt her neck. She might have said she'd gone through the windshield too, but I can't be sure. She seemed to be healthy and happy all the times we saw her, so I suppose she was just a very strong person. At any rate, despite some of the confusion on how she had managed the house or where she worked, I think she just dazzled Chris. Sure, he was supporting himself and doing really well, especially for his age, but she was living in a house that cost nearly half a million dollars and had furniture and art inside of it that was probably worth half that again. And her car was an Escalade after all. So if she started talking to him right away about what to do with money, he most probably would have listened to her. He certainly seemed to be listening to everything she told him right from the beginning. I don't think I worried about him much when he was little. He was such a good kid, and in high school, he played baseball and got straight A's, so I didn't have any reason to worry, but I did anyway, because he was so incredibly shy and quiet, and I didn't want him to be lonely or missing out on all the silly adventures that we parents complain about, but expect anyway, and then later shake our heads over and laugh. He was terribly serious at an age when most kids are not. Our daughter was so busy and overscheduled with friends and boyfriends and keeping the AT&T in business and pushing our rules that it was hard not to notice the difference between them as teenagers. Still, what more could I have reasonably wanted than a son who did all the right things and just seemed to enjoy going to see NASCAR races with his dad while maintaining high grades and playing sports. And yet, okay, I'd hear from my mother, who the kids called Oma, about the school pickups. I was working, so she would go and collect the kids for me after school. She'd drive up to get Chris first at his elementary school, and promptly... Out he would come, my sweet boy, ambling out the door, giving her his quiet smile and saying thank you as he got in the car to wait for his sister. Wait, they did too. Sarah was so popular that it could take her a good half hour or more after school to say goodbye to all of her friends that she wouldn't get a chance to talk to by phone for an hour or so. It used to drive my mom With Sarah, I knew she'd have her pick, and right when she was ready, and she did, she went to college, fell in love with Steve, married him, and started her career, and her living happily ever after in the usual small starter house. With Chris, I didn't know so much as hope for the best. He was so shy, in fact, that a girl had to ask him to the senior prom, so I think If I can remember correctly, I guess I knew he'd have to meet a pretty outgoing girl to bring him out of his shell. I knew that when he did, that he'd be completely devoted to her and try his very best to make her happy. And since he is so much like his dad, I figured her chances for that 
were better than average. After high school, Chris, who, like his dad, could fix anything mechanical that had been invented, had set his sights on the NASCAR Academy. And so off he went at 18, and after he completed his schooling there, he was hired by a Ford dealership in Monroeville. He's always been a hard worker, and he liked the work too. And we had raised both our kids to be careful about money. For a while there, it seemed like he had learned it too, because he started right off by saving up about every cent that didn't go to rent or food. And before too long, he had bought a brand new car, a Ford Mustang, and he only owed $8,000 on it while managing to put another 11000 into savings, which is pretty good for a young man of 24. Ronnie and I are careful people, so nothing about Chris's finances surprised us then. Our kids were doing well and their entries into adulthood had almost been a paint-by-number deal. School, jobs, marriage, and a baby for our oldest, and Chris was so young that we weren't at all concerned that he hadn't met anyone special yet. Then we got a call from Chris that he had, in fact, met a girl, and she was special, and he wanted us to meet her, too. Chapter 2 Chris lived and worked in Charlotte, and so we didn't see as much of him as we would have liked, and he's never exactly been the chatty type on the phone. I'm sort of the person, too, who figures no news is good news. I knew he had a pretty new girlfriend and work, and I didn't worry. He talked to his dad by phone, and I knew if there were any problems, Ronnie would tell me, and he didn't mention any, so why worry? Sarah was pretty pregnant then with Ruby, and the party was just going to be a, a small backyard one. Wyatt, like most little boys, had a Power Ranger toy he liked. Shanann knew about this, and she suggested that it be a Power Rangers party. Our daughter is a pretty easygoing girl, and so she didn't mind if Shanann wanted to help out or whatever. At any rate, one of Shan's ideas was that she and Chris show up at the party dressed as Power Rangers, and I guess she got him to rent the outfits or buy them. I'm not sure which. But when the day came, Chris had forgotten the helmets, bearing in mind that if it was a three or four hour drive from where he lived to Sarah's house, and that Wyatt was three, and that all of us were just happy he could come. It took us all back when Janan told him in no uncertain terms that he was going to turn right around and drive straight back three hours to get the helmets and then return. A six-hour trip and obviously another three hours back home for a total of 12 hours on the road and for what? We all asked him that, told him not to go. Don't be silly. Why a good care less? Just stay. Enjoy yourself. Visit with us. Relax, we said. But it was Shanann he was looking for approval already. And he looked anxious. We'd never seen him look that way. Chris was always a relaxed kid and a young man. But she told him to go back and get those helmets, and that's just what he did. I guess that was the first time we began to worry. It was just the beginning. We met her parents when they came up, and her brother, and they seemed like nice people. I'll admit, too, that I wasn't looking to get really close to Shanann, not because I disliked her, but because her conversations were so personal that they made me a little uncomfortable. There are lots of people who like to tell you everything about themselves when they meet you, but I'm not one of them, and that's okay in both directions, I think. Like I said, I wasn't worried. The first time I did become a little concerned was at our grandson Wyatt's third birthday. Chapter 3. Like every other family, when their adult child falls in love, it wasn't going to matter what we thought about their kid's new love interest. What would matter is what we said. Which, if you ever want to have a continuing relationship with your child, better be nothing at all. And so that's what we did. I mean, who knows? People on the internet call me a crazy possessive mother, and Chris seemed to allude to that a little bit in his first interview. My mom was a little hesitant. The detective jumped in. Yeah, losing her baby and all. 
He shrugged and smiled. I have to admit, I was a little taken aback by his answer because this was just a few weeks after Shanann had written about me on Facebook and she'd written a lot, saying amongst other things that Sarah was the golden child and that Chris was always second. Sometimes you really can't win. The simple truth is that I have always been crazy about both our kids and so is Ronnie. But yes, I've been extremely close to my daughter who is an an astounding young woman and who, with our beloved, very nice son-in-law, generously shares time with their children and themselves with us. That doesn't mean I loved her more. We just had more in common. For example, we like to talk to each other. Something Chris and Ronnie definitely had in common was that they did not have to talk much when together. Not that you can talk anyway at drag races or NASCAR unless you like to speak with bullhorns. Ronnie's closeness to Chris does not mean he loved him more than Sarah. These are just untrue things and they are hurtful from anyone. There's a good old-fashioned poem about this that I guess everyone could agree on. A daughter is a daughter all of your life. A son is a son till he takes a wife. It just means, really, that you pretty much have to understand and accept that once your kids grow up and marry, that things will be different and that if you want to see them and to keep your peace, you need to like their choices, whether you do or not, especially if you have grandchildren. I got lucky with Sarah's, Steve, not so lucky with Chris's choice, but I figured it didn't have to be a disaster. We could be polite and friendly and... If so, maybe Ronnie and I would get every other Christmas with them, and that's the best any parent can hope for, really. Chris was obviously obviously in love. We were keeping quiet and going on with our lives, and a few weeks later, Chris called up to tell us that he just bought an engagement ring for Shanann, one they had picked out together, and before I could say congratulations, he went on to tell me that he had paid $12,000 for it. I have to say I was shocked. $12,000 is a down payment on a house. Or he could have paid off his car. Or it was $1,000 more than he had in his life savings. And besides, he was an auto mechanic, not Prince William or Donald Trump. Maybe what I just said will make people laugh at me because maybe that's not a lot of money to other people. But to our family... It is. I said, son, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Couldn't you have found something nice for less money? He didn't say anything. I think he handed the phone over to Ronnie, but I found out later that he told Shanann what I'd said, and she was really angry about that. I was sorry to hear that because I'd been trying hard to maintain a relationship with her during this time, she had a habit of saying confiding things to me and like I said I'm not used to someone I don't know being that open or maybe the problem from my standpoint was that all of her confidences to me were about how sort of pathetic she found my son it's possible I suppose that she blamed me for his shortcomings and she hoped that by telling me how he couldn't even wash dishes right or cook or how the way he dressed embarrassed her and how she didn't like his hair or his weight either. He was too skinny. That we could maybe collaborate on improving him together and become closer. I didn't like it though, and I know it showed. But now she was going to be our daughter-in-law, and that meant if Chris didn't mind her criticism, then I had better stop minding it for him. We'd make a new start, a reset. It would begin at the beach house that Sarah and Steve had already rented for a coming stay, a family week. Chris had already been invited, and we knew that he was bringing Shanann even before the ring announcement. The plan was for all of us to spend time together and enjoy each other and witness the formal proposal she wanted him to make with a ring. Shanann managed to find a nearby beach house on the same street as the one our family was in. For her family to stay in. That sounded good too. A chance to start getting to know our future in-laws better. And we could all become good friends before the wedding. 
everything went okay at first. We were all happy to be on the beach. Chris and Shanann in particular love being outside all day and they really were a beautiful couple and they seemed to be in love and happy and the Rusiks were delighted with our boy and well yeah it seemed like this might end up well after all. Sarah and Steve and Wyatt and our brand new granddaughter were there and having a good time too. The sun shone, and at least from my perspective, our Wyatt was like like having the sun around all the time. We just adored him. He was such a happy, handsome little guy, always ready for an adventure. And for Wyatt, having Uncle Chris around was as good as Christmas morning. Chris was uncle, and good buddy rolled up into one. He played with him and looked like he was having so much fun doing it. Little kids do know the difference between someone who is really enjoying their company and someone who is doing it for show. Though I'll admit, they'll take the latter if the former isn't available. After all, it's better than not having any attention at all. Kids aren't stupid. So why you didn't even want to eat breakfast first thing in the morning? without including his pal, Uncle Chris. He'd march right into the bedroom that Chris and Shanann were staying in and knock and holler, good morning, to hopefully wake up Chris so that he didn't miss any part of the fun. I guess like all adoring grandmas, and I am definitely one of those, I thought it was adorable. We all did. Well, not all of us apparently. The second morning it happened, Chris found me in the kitchen and asked me to keep Wyatt from knocking on their door. I was surprised and asked him why. He said Shanann didn't like it and it was ruining her morning's sleep. I told him that um, he could tell his sister that himself if he wanted it to stop and that he knew how much Wyatt loved him and that it would hurt his feelings. What was the big deal anyway? It wasn't that early. Chris looked a little embarrassed and shrugged and said, well, it's, it's her vacation too, I guess. Anyway, that was the end of it as far as I knew. Something else happened that week, which was much worse, but our family doesn't discuss it. The proposal happened during the week as well. Chris and Shanann went down to the beach with a photographer she'd hired and Chris popped the question and she said yes. And then they posed for pictures and they later showed us. They were in their swimsuits and they looked young and beautiful and happy. Chris was still very slim and muscled then and so was she and everybody got a little choked up that there was going to be a wedding and then we all went home. And while I wouldn't have said it had gone smoothly, I decided to try and not think about it anymore and just get on with things. Then I received an email from Shanann that shocked me completely. The gist of it was that she wanted me to know that she did not like me one bit. She thought I was a bad influence and a bad mother to Chris. She said that she knew I did not like her either, and the less we saw of each other, the better. I never said an unkind word to her. I felt like I'd been over backwards to welcome her into our family, and... I also thought wrongly, obviously, that I, I had hidden my doubts about her. It would be a lie to say I wasn't completely devastated by that email. In my whole life, no one has ever said anything like that to me. Like, Chris, I'm shy. I don't get into arguments with people or raise my voice. I cried and I showed it to Ronnie, who told me not to answer and just to forget about it. My husband really can do things like that. It didn't take... I didn't take his advice. I wish I had now because what does any of it matter anymore? It did then though and then is what I am having to remember right now. I wrote her back. I told her how badly she'd hurt my feelings. I told her that whether it looked like it or not that I was trying. I told her that I didn't like the way she talked about my son or how she'd acted with my grandson but that at least I was making an effort. Then I think I told her that I wouldn't have ever written an email like this if I hadn't gotten hers. And it all seems so stupid and petty now. And it was then, 
ugly and petty and is sorry a beginning is a family trying to blend could have. I didn't say anything to Chris though because they just gotten engaged and it would have upset him and Ronnie said not to and he was probably right. I don't know what I thought would happen but what I wanted to happen was for it to go away and not to ever have her or anyone really be as mean to me as that again or make me lose my temper as I had. I couldn't deal with things like this and up until then I never had to. So having been hit and having responded to my shame, I decided to turn the other cheek and try harder. This as it happens was not a very good plan either. And that ends chapter three of All My Broken Pieces, Cindy Watt's story. And I will pick up with chapter four, five, the second half of chapter five, and the extension of chapter five in a video to come very soon. I hope you enjoyed. Please leave a comment and let me know what you think about Cindy Watt's account of how everything went down before the tragic Watts family murders.